this seminar, Post-Populism, Nationalisms and Identities. I will have two presenters, uh, Amit Singh and Cristiano Janola. Amit Singh is a PhD candidate in the doctoral program Human Rights in Contemporary Societies. In Cristiano Janola is in the commission of PI of the research project Unpacking Populism, Comparing the Formation of Emotion Narratives and Their Effects on Political Behavior. And we have a special discussant with us, which is Professor Boventura, needs no introduction. Uh, he, he will, uh, in the end, uh, open the floor for debate and discussion. So I would call uh, Amit Singh, he will be the first presenter. It is a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. In this discussion, I will be talking about <coughs> how Hindu nationalism took a populistic turn employing Hindu religion in marginalizing Indian Muslim at the same time excluding the possibility of resistance as well. So during my discussion I would be covering these points. I will be talking about Hindu nationalism, Hindu populism <coughs> and populistic tendencies in Hindu nationalism, Hindu populism and Islamophobia and possibility of resistance against Hindu. India got independence in 1947 from Britain. It turned out to be a secular state then. However, there were a bunch of people and the groups. They never wanted India to be a secular state. They wanted India to be a Hindu state because 80% population of India is Hindu and around 16% are Muslim. So one of the such organizations is called RSS, Rashtriya Sayam Sevak Sangh. It is India's most staunch proponent of Hindu nationalism and currently they are in the power ruling India through its political font known as Bharatiya Janata Party with Narendra Modi as its Prime Minister. Before I proceed, I would like to explain <coughs> what is Hindu nationalism or Hindutva. They both are the same. Hindutva is an ethnic form of nationalism, is radically far right, is authoritarian in nature, it means it seeks absolute loyalty to the nation without any question. It's based on a Hindu supremacism. It, it boasts itself its connection with Aryan theory. It negates racial and religious equality. It imposes uniformity through one single religion. It means a single religion of Hinduism, a single language of Hindi, and single culture of uh, Hindu. That shall be for Indians. No other culture shall be regarded as well. Hindu nationalism is inherently anti-diversity and inherently anti-Muslim. It intolerant to religious pluralism, secularism. It rejects non-violence. One of the cadre of RSS killed Mahatma Gandhi because he disliked Gandhi appreciating Hindu-Muslim culture. <coughs> And ultimate, their target is basically to turn India into a Hindu state just like Pakistan for Muslim. And this is what's happening at the moment in India. Uh, scholars have argued that populist uses the divisive boundaries of us and them which religion provides them. Populists can exploit religion of majority population and exacerbate religious conflict, especially in the society where there is a historical uh, precedent of uh, animosity between two groups. In case of India, there has been a conflict between Hindu and Muslim in pre-colonial times. So Hindu nationalist leaders such as current Prime Minister Narendra Modi has been exploiting these uh, religious conflict very well, effectively in fact. So Hindu populism is the use of Hindu nationalism and religion as a basis for populist politics. Also, Hindu nationalism as a populist discourse keeps religion in play, enhances religiosity by preserving religious identity. So, the proponent of Hindu populism always keep people angry. And this anger is directed towards Muslims, Christians, seculars, liberals, holding them accountable for why India is backward. All the problem happens because India is dominated by Muslim, by secular. So 
the follower of Hindu nationalist always keep uh, keep people enraged and uh, a kind of uh, emotions, uh, very anti-Muslim emotions is always going on. <coughs> so when these kind of a national narrative being propagated 24 hours through the national media and through the government proponent in Ganna channels, then it creates social distance between religious community, example, Hindu and Muslim. What happening in, in India at the moment, there have been a cases of a mob lynching on a weekly basis and Hindus are lost sentiment against Muslim. They have developed a kind of a naughty conscience. They are watching violence against Muslim being happened and they are not intervening. They have justified this violence on the basis that their culture is better than Muslim. Muslims are savage, therefore they need to be killed. Something similar happened during the Second World War in Germany. I borrowed this idea of Nazi concept from Koch. So the emotional response of Hindu populist has been manifested in different kind of event, incidents against Muslim. One of them is Corona Jihad. Corona Jihad is the idea that Muslims are responsible for spreading Corona in India. And there is also called love jihad. It means Muslim use lure Hindu women in order to marry them and convert their religion into Muslim. So India can be a Muslim state. Along with that, there have been a cases of mob lynching of Muslim. Beef is banned in India. So if someone is found eating beef, he can be lynched. Many Muslims have been lynched because they have been blamed they were eating beef. And especially these kind of work is being done by the Hindu vigilante groups. In addition, there have been many cases of vandalizing masks by Hindu groups. Uh, apart from that, uh, by parting Muslim vegetables, vendors and sellers is becoming more regular cases. And there was a very interesting case of bully by app. This is a software developed by a Hindu fanatic. It's a software which auction Muslim women without knowing them. It was very controversial, but this happened last year actually. So we, we see some populistic tendencies in the Hindutva discourse. Uh, Hindutva discourse believe only the Hindus are the real son of the soul. Muslims and Christians are excluded because their sacred land is not in India. Example, the Christians' sacred land is in Vatican and Muslims is Makkah and Madina. Also, Hindutva populism believe in homogenization of Hindu identity. It means those who are living in India, including Muslims and Christian, they are called Hindu. They cannot have their separate distinct identity. So everyone in India who is living is Hindu. There is no other identity exists. There are other small identity like Dalits, there are uh, Jan, they are Sheikh, they are both, but all these small identities are subs subsumed under the category of Hindutva. At the same time, appeal to Hindu aggressive cultural nationalism, it is one of the essential part of a Hindu populist. As I said, Hindu nationalists don't believe in non-violence. They, they, uh, they are very violent against those who basically challenge them and they promote a kind of very aggressive cultural nationalism and this has been a cause of many violence against Muslim. Especially in some instances, Muslim were forced to chant the name of Hindu God. Also, Hindu populism is an anti elsicism It says the leader of uh, BJP, RSS, and basically uh, Narendra Modi, he says he represents ordinary people. And other parties, example Congress, which make India a secular state, Congress is a party of any because it does not represent India, it represents few secular people. So there has been this idea that other parties are corrupt and they are very elite except this Hindutva party. And people also able to buy this idea actually because this has been propagated constantly through the social media. Hindu populism believe in nostalgia. They have a strong fascination uh, towards ancient <coughs> India. They believe in the greatness of old India. They believe that once India was a master of the world, master in science and technology, they have this fantasy of the kingdom of Lord Ram. And they believe there was a time when everything was perfect in Indian society and society was 
society was perfectly peaceful because everything was following the traditional social order. What is the traditional social order? Hindu believe in a caste system. So those who are believing in caste system, it means untouchables has to follow uh, except inferior position, just like the women does. And those who breach this traditional social norm are quite often met with violence, as, we'll, as we will see further. So since Narendra Modi came into power in 2014, he is also a cadre of RSS. And then Hindu nationalism took a little bit populistic turn. I must say Hindu nationalism and Hindu populism very much close to each other, but they are not the same concept. Uh, Modi has been regarded as an authoritarian populist. He has been effectively divided the population in two groups. Who is the people? So people is Hindu. They are oppressed by few elites, by few secular. Hindus are victimized because of the Muslim, because of the Congress elite. And Modi has been able to sell this majority idea to the people that India is a country of Hindu. They are, therefore, it must be a Hindu state. Modi is notorious for his anti-Muslim view. He is known as the butcher of Gujarat for his complicity in Godhra communal riots in 2002, where around 3,000 Muslims were muscad or killed when he was the chief minister of Gujarat. So Modi is already notorious for his anti-Muslim view. And due to, since he came to the power, due to his populist call to Hindu nationalism, India's more than 200 million Muslims are victims of everyday Islamophobia and hate speech, which is being normalized constantly through social media and mainstream media. <coughs> As you can see in this cartoon, after every royal, BJP, the Hindu Nationalist Party, gained in political term. In 1984, they had just two seats out of 542 seats in, in national parliament. Now they have 302 seats. Because whenever there is an election, RSS, a Hindu fundamentalist group, through their vigilante group, they always organize some riots. And this riot basically mobilize people on the religious line and Hindu tend to vote Hindu uh, leaders actually. And this ultimately brought this Hindu nationalism into the power. The man holding the trophy is basically represent the current Home Minister of India. He was a criminal once. So Narendra Modi in his emotional speech has been successfully generated a kind of an anxiety among Hindu population holding Muslim responsible for everything from the population growth to the unemployment to the terrorism. And this narrative has been set using different kind of uh, emotion of humili humiliation and pride. Hindu nationalists have been selectively picking up some certain event from the past of ancient Indian history. Example, they say Hindu were oppressed under the Islamic rule 500 years ago. And they also hold Muslim responsible for the partition of India in 1947. So these events has a 9-11 impact on Hindu population. So these leaders quite often mention these events, which basically uh, uh, mobilize Hindu population to vote for them. Apart from that, Hindu nationalist leaders also talking about restoring last glories of Hindu's kingdom. Example, building the temple which has been described by the Islamic ruler 500 years ago. Example, a temple in Kashi, Mathura, Ayodhya. There was a mosque in Ayodhya uh, known as a Babri mosque. It was demolished in 1992 by Hindu uh, militant. Afterwards, there was riots and many of thousands of people died during, uh, because of this conflict between Hindu and Muslim. And now the next target is a mosque in Kashi. That is also Varanasi. Varanasi is a parliamentary constitution of uh, constituent of current Prime Minister Narendra Modi. It's considered a sacred seat of Hinduism and that is also my hometown. Apart from these strategies, uh, Hindu government is also replacing the Muslim names with the Hindu name. Example, uh, Faizabad become Ayodhya, as you can see Ayodhya. In addition, 
current government has been erasing the contribution of Muslim uh, leaders, Muslim rulers in their Indian history. They are erasing their historical contribution, replacing the, their contribution with the fake history of Hindu nationalists. This is fact that RSS never participated in colonial struggle. <coughs> in fact, they were opposed to Gandhi. So they, so they have nothing, something, they have nothing very special to talk about, to boast about. So they are creating fake history, telling that they have done a lot for the uh, Indian colonial struggle actually. So the past is very much present. Past hatred being channelized for the present benefits successfully by this populist government. Therefore, the constant leveling of Muslim as an enemy of the nation, invader, traitor has created an anti-Muslim environment in India, which has brought India on the brink of genocide. So in first of picture, we can see a Muslim man is being paraded uh, through the street by Hindu vigilante, and he is being beaten by basically Hindu groups. Issue could be anything, actually. It, it, it's a daily occurrence, it's not something exception. In other picture, we can see uh, Tabri Jansari, he was killed because he was blamed, he was eating beef. So Muslims were basically protesting against the mob lynching of this man in June 2009. Yesterday there was a lynching as well. And there is also economic boycott of Muslim. Uh, in first picture, we can see a uh, a fruit of the Muslim uh, uh, vendor was basically destroyed by Hindu vigilante group. In other picture, we can see a Muslim Bengal seller is being beaten by Hindu fundamentalist group. Usually, the Bengal sellers are Muslim and the buyer are usually Hindu women. So, Muslim sellers are usually warned that they shall not sell their stuff to Hindu women. Also, there has been many assemblies organized by Hindu religious group calling for Muslim genocide in India. Government has been complacent. They are not taking any step. Such event is happening in Delhi, in Haridwar, and also Genocide Watch has predicted there might be a genocide in India in the near future. <coughs> Apart from that, as I said earlier, that Hindu nationalism believe in affirming traditional social role. So traditional social role means affirming the inferior position of Dalits and women. So those who try to breach this norm, they are being killed or they, they are being harassed by Hindu vigilante group. After the BJP came to power, we can see the crime against Dalits and tribal has already increased. And Bollywood is also not <coughs> contributing in Islamophobic narrative. In first picture, Kashmir file, in this film, Muslim has been portrayed as a terrorist. And it has been shown that because of the Muslim terrorists, uh, Hindus become refugee in their own country, in Kashmir. In, in the next film, it's called Hum Do Hamare Bara, it's in Hindi. It says, uh, Muslims are responsible for the population growth. And one family can have 12 children. One couple can have 12 children. And this way, they are planning to overpopulate India and turning India into a Muslim state. In the last film, uh, Padmavati, uh, they generally depict Muslim ruler as a oppressive and uh, forcing Hindu Rajput queen to marry them. This is a, another way to create a kind of resentment, emotional resentment against Muslim majority currently. In this peculiar case, 26 people were <coughs> slapped charges just for praying inside their own home. These people, these Muslims, they are offering namaj inside their own home and police charge them because they are offering prayer at their own home. This was very surprising actually, and ironic. And Gandhi is not even a spare. Gandhi is hated by Hindu nationalists, as he was killed by Hindu nationalists, because Gandhi was in favor of Hindu-Muslim brotherhood. And in first picture, we can see the Lord, uh, the Goddess Durga, is slaying the demon. And if you look at carefully, uh, the demon is basically Mahatma Gandhi, a guy wearing a glass. If there is a sunglasses, you can see. So the demon is represented as a Mahatma Gandhi. So he is being slain. That's how people uh, represent or talk about these days, some people. 
In other picture, uh, a leader of a Hindu fundamentalist group is shooting a picture of Mahatma Gandhi on his death anniversary, uh, showing their resentment against Mahatma Gandhi. And those who are resisting against such atrocities, they are treating as an enemy of the state. Example, in one of the pictures, we can see there is a banner and there are some photographs. These photographs of the Muslim who were resisting against Narendra Modi Homeo, uh, homophobic and anti-Muslim uh, policies. So their picture was posted with the, their name and address. Some of their houses were bulldozed. So if anyone, not just a Muslim, if anyone, especially secular, communist, uh, liberal, secular, they criticize government or Narendra Modi, they risk their life. In other picture, we can see the student being bitten by police. That's how police in India basically treat protesters. They are resisting against one of the anti-Muslim law, which I'll talk further. So there is a resistance going on, and these are the open defiance. It means we can see in open. One of such uh, resistance was in 2015, when around 15 riders returned their award to protest against <coughs> the alleged growth in intolerance against uh, Muslim under the Narendra Modi regime. These writers were infuriated because of the cases of the mob lynching. And those who, who were protesting against were termed as an uh, anti-national, <laughs> anti-Hindu, and traitor. In another most important resistance against this government was a protest against, it's called NTCA protest, Citizenship Amendment Act. <clears throat> this act has a potential to exclude Muslims from citizenship. According to this, this act, uh, anyone can seek, uh, can seek shelter in India from the neighboring state except Muslims. So Muslims were denied asylum on the basis of their religion. Obviously, it was very discriminatory. So there was a large, huge protest against this uh, act. And what was very important, a large number of women, Muslim women, participated. They were known as the heroes of the Shaheen Bagh. I will show the picture later on. Another very important protest, as we know, a farther protest. In, <coughs> it, it basically ran, it, it, it considered one of the world's largest demonstration and probably the biggest protest in human history by Times Magazine. Farmers were protesting against a bill which, uh, a bill was about contract farming. The bill has a possibility to losing their land to big corporates. So farmers were protesting for one year and ultimately the bill was withdrawn. When most of the bill these days is not passed through the debate in parliament. They are being passed through the judicial order. It means government institutions are being passed. There is no discussion. Also, we see there is a remarkable women's participation in the farther protest. <laughs> and these two events also show that Indian women, especially, they, especially in the rural area, they are really capable to lead this movement. Apart from these resistance, there are resistance going on, but they are basically sporadic inconsistent and they are on ad hoc basis and these assistants are coming from intellectuals, journalists, judges, ex, bureaucrats, students, they are writing letters to the government also uh, or the academics basically they are organizing a free his history class explaining the contribution of Muslim ruler to India and also trying to dispel the fake history promoted by Hindu nationalists. Also feminist NGOs are also fighting against Hindu fundamentalism, Hindu patriarchy. <coughs> there are underground student uh, organizations, they are working against it actually. And it's happening at the moment. So in this picture, we can see, <coughs> these are the Muslim <coughs> women of Sahin Bagh. This was the first time in the India history when Muslim women participated in such a large number uh, against this particular uh, law. Unfortunately, NTCA protest was crushed in the pretext of controlling the COVID pandemic. But this shook the government of Narendra Modi. Under resistance which I observed, I interviewed these people uh, in Varanasi. I call it invisible defiance. There were some underground student group. They, they don't have any name, but they are basically, they write graffiti on the university wall, in the city, 
and they write against government, they write against Hindu fundamentalism and uh, they are very active but they don't have any name. I, somehow I was able to trace them but uh, they are basically vulnerable to arrest and police harassment. Another very important thing I have observed, although I did not interview them, other group, they are Hindutva supporter and they are turning against Hindutva. I couldn't interview them because if they know that I am a scholar, I might be in trouble. So I observe such conversation in private spaces, in public spaces. So example, one of the police officials was talking about, he says that Modi and Amisha, the current uh, Home Minister of India, he says people, <coughs> they are dividing people uh, using divide and rule policy like the British did, and they are weakening the country. And another official are saying they are manipulating laws to frame the political opponent and the student activist. This is what happening. Government, uh, the constitution is being used against religion. Law is being manipulated against those who are challenging government actually. So some official, they are aware of it and they are starting opposing it. But these discussions are still within private spaces. It's just a matter of time when these uh, these resistant narrative become from move from uh, margin to mainstream. Then we will see the real change. But at the moment, these are just being going on actually. And another supporter of Hindutva, uh, he said, "Why only one percent of India is making progress? As we know, currently the richest, the third richest person of world is an Indian, Gautam Adani. Most of the Indian company." Uh, government company has been sold to him. He is a friend of Narendra Modi. So people are aware of it. They are concerned about the poor economic situation. And they are also concerned about social political unrest. And they are getting unrest, uh, uh, restless about it actually. But they have been a very hardcore supporter of Hindutva. <coughs> Two years ago, it would, it would not have been possible for these people to discuss these things. Or no one can criticize Hindu nationalism in front of them. But now I can see things are happening. So this is a picture of our protest in Delhi. In this protest, basically farmer occupied one area of Delhi. They blocked the road for a year until unless they win. Of course, this law was repealed because of the election actually. And these are the women who are participating in farmer protest. Uh, mostly these were the women whose relatives were killed during the protest. And <coughs> these student groups, they are against the saffronization of universities at BSU, uh, Banaras Hindu University in Varanasi. Saffronization is a process which is a mainstreaming of Hindu nationalism in the institution and structure, where the supporter of Hindu nationalist being appointed as a vice chancellor and secular and liberal uh, scholars are being rejected or being expelled from the university. So in, in university, you cannot talk about Hindu nationalism anymore. But there have been some protests, and this is pictured in 2018. You can see some people are still protesting. <coughs> this is very interesting. I took this photo this year. And this is a, <coughs> this event is called My Night, My Own. It's a women protest in Varanasi. Happened on 14th August. It's the middle of the night. Women came out together to fight against uh, Hindu patriarchy, violence against women and transgender. This was surprising considering the unsafe situation, especially the night in India. These women came out, mostly university students, and they organized this event every year on 14th August. Uh, so it also happened this year, and uh, they are very active. It's, they run an NGO called Dakhal, means intervention. This is a graffiti uh, on one of the uh, University campus, it says Brahmin, your grave will be dug in the land of BSU, Banaras University. Brahmins are <coughs> the higher caste in India, they are currently in power and basically they call the sorts in everything. Also in university, caste play a very important role. The students are basically discriminated on the basis of their caste. So untouchable students, they always face problems, harassment from them. So this, this, this is the graffiti, this is the act of underground student group. <coughs> okay, so this is a picture we can see there has been some protest uh, against the killing of 
rationalist, academics, journalist, and last but not the least, now what we see a United India March, which is three, which is covering 3,500 kilometer. This march is organized by the ruler, uh, Secular Congress Party under Rahul Gandhi to unite India against heat and division and to connect to uh, to effort. It's an effort to promote unity and diversity. Not even a Mahatma Gandhi has covered such a long distance. The this India March has been receiving a wonderful response from people, and by this way, Congress is also trying to reinventing itself and becoming more closer to the people and shattering his elite image. So we can see there is still hope. So what I can say, if the resistance continues, maybe because of a dwindling economic situation and political economic unrest, there might be a change. However, if Hindutva populism continue for long, India may disintegrate and may become a mirror image of Pakistan, like Kister Jaffer, let's say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amit. Now, Christian uh, Janawa. <coughs> so, while I open the presentation, let me thank Bruno Sena Martins for organizing this panel, Amit Singh for sharing the panel with me, and of course, Professor Roberto Souza Santos for being the discussant. So, I'm going to make a, a presentation which is um, of a theoretical kind. And I'm happy to do this after Amit's uh, presentation because I hope that what I'm going to say is going to match what, with what he has shown just now. Uh, this presentation is also part of the UNPOC project that uh, uh, Bruno mentioned. This is the project in uh, a slide. So it's uh, a cooperation between SESH and uh, Center for Research in Neuropsychology and Cognitive and Behavioral uh, Intervention um, that is a center of the Faculty of Psychology and Education uh, here at the University of Coimbra. You see it's an interdisciplinary team. Our central focus is on emotional narratives. I'm going to explain what we think they are. This is a concept that we are trying to found to, uh, to ground in, in, in theory and we want to understand how emotion narratives um, <coughs> enable uh, us to understand the way uh, political phenomena, especially uh, populist parties, uh, to mobilize uh, people, so to impact in political behavior. You can see the main research questions, as you can see, they are both theoretical but also empirical. And we are also trying to put forward methodology to study uh, uh, emotion narratives, uh, entering therefore in a very interdisciplinary field. And the presentation of today is going to be uh, very much based on uh, uh, social psychology. You see we adopt mixed methods for data collection and analysis and then uh, we compare parties in Portugal and Italy. Our website is about to be launched in a few days, so the website will be ampop.sesh.ucpt. Uh, so the presentation will focus on identity formation, on intergroup polarization, intergroup emotions and finally on emotion narratives. There is a, another topic which is cross-cutting the presentation together with emotion narratives which is political mythologies. I will also come to the uh, definition, I hope at the end of uh, the presentation. You call me five minutes before the end, right? Yes, I will. That's great. Um, this is therefore what I'm going to try to do during this presentation, starting from the fact that populism is our uh, object of study, but we also have, as Amita said, we have to distinguish populism from uh, the far right, the extreme right, uh, whatever right uh, movements we want to study. They are not necessarily the same, and also from nationalism and chauvinism. Sometimes these, all these factors are together in phenomena, uh, in political phenomena, but not always. 
And what we want to understand is the impact that emotion have in the identity formation within these political phenomena. We hypothesize that um, populist and nationalist political phenomena impact on political behavior precisely because they, are, they have mastered the way emotions uh, uh, work in politics. And so therefore I, I ask them why this happened, how, where it happened, and what lessons for democratic theory. I have some uh, s uh, proposed response uh, responses to these questions in my last slide, and hopefully they will also be useful for the debate. So the, to start with the definition of uh, how collective identities are produced in populism, this is very well known in the literature on populism and uh, uh, it is also um, uh, all the time more emerging as you know uh, reformulation or reappropriation of uh, Ernesto Laclau's theory on equivalence and difference where equivalence um, is produced to create what in political uh, psychology is called uh, the in-group and uh, the out-group that is uh, produced by the logic of, of difference, differentiating us from them. So this is very well known. Now I try to um, sketch out a few characteristics that you see on the slide to define what is the in-group and to define what is the out-group in general. However, we have to understand that different uh, populist movements uh, certainly have different outgroups. For instance, minorities are not the target of left-wing uh, populist movements generally, but they are normally the target of uh, right-wing populist movements. So uh, the fact that other groups exist depends on which kind of uh, um, orientation the movement has. For sure there is the elite, that is the main characteristic of populism, even if we go back to the most used definition by Kasmude, uh, and the fact that essentially populism is a thin ideology that divides uh, the corrupt elite from the homogeneous people that hold sovereignty in a, a democratic context. Um, so, I think that the identity formation in populist movement is created through three, um, let's call them moments, that are based on an ongoing process. I think the process that is created, you see it's circular, so you, you, you will not find these three moments separated in the narrative of these parties, but you will find always them together. Uh, and the, the, the narrative uh, I frame it into what I call political uh, mythology, and uh, um, as I said, I will come to that later. Um, but mainly, uh, this is where these parties define who we are as an in-group, like eventually as the people, uh, and then what do we have? So the normally touching on socio-economic uh, context, and what we deserve, so what we are looking forward to. And generally, this is created to, through a reading of reality which is extremely um, um, uh, polarized um, through the sense of crisis. We are in a crisis because generally, as Amit has explained earlier on, we were so good in the past and now we, are, we have lost that. So, um, in that sense, Amit spoke about ontological security, and I think it makes sense. But also, it uh, identifies dispossession as the cause of this crisis, which is then we will see related to the outgroups. And this leads to the loss of social status and harmony within the in group. The in group is worsened by the situation of crisis due to. Uh, uh, this process of uh, dispossession that has been perpetrating throughout history and especially recent history. And then what is proposed is to um, 
to through the polarization between us and them, as if the people we want to restore what we have lost, they have led to us to the crisis, so we create something new. And this identity is what Laclaue called the empty signifier, because it doesn't identify any specific social group, but it identifies all of them together, without them sharing any uh, a, a strong demand, or whoever sharing a share, uh, uh, sharing a uh, social, social, socio-political identity, and uh, this would lead to restoration. So, if we think of the in-group and out-group, these slides gives I use these slides to give a, a sketched idea, of course, a much schematic idea of what I think when I refer to elites. Uh, and different parties refer to different kinds of elites. This is very much dependent on the context. And then uh, minorities. As I said, uh, whereas um, some elites, especially the economic elites, are central for any kind of populism, or sorry, for all the kind of populism, um, other kinds of elites, like the political elite and cultural elite, may be specific of the right-wing populists. We here talking about cultural Marxism. This is an example of this is declinated into, into the language. Um, and the political elite, it always depends whether the populist phenomenon is in power or not. Because if, if they are in power, generally they don't um, produce anti-elitism within the country, but they still produce anti-elitism, for instance, with the European Union in the case of uh, Hungary. Uh, and, and that is uh, understood especially as economic elite related to you know, big capital and so on. Minorities, I sketched here out some of those that exist, but it is not intended to be uh, limited to this. Indeed, uh, other kind of identities related to gender, for instance, are also part of the outgroups, generally. So if we want to summarize and sketch very easily, but of course, of course, do schematically the difference, I would say that uh, populist mobilization on the left is uh, specifically targeting economic inequalities, while on the right, it is based on a cultural identity, where uh, there is a primacy of uh, shared values related to the past, and therefore traditions, generally also related to a strong sense of the nation, uh, the patriots, and, uh, and also what uh, is related to the way this is narrated in the public. So, uh, toponomasty and, uh, um, and um, you know, the heritage, I mean, that's shown how uh, Modi is changing even the narrative in the landscape of India through changing statues, statues, uh, name of places, name of streets, and so on. I base this um, uh, the approach to the emotion narrative on intergroup emotion theory, which um, very briefly sketched out in this slide. Uh, and it claims that social emotions are uh, distinct from individual emotions, uh, so that we have to uh, study them separately than from what we do with individual emotion. Although, I mean, the way the individual feels about them uh, can be approached at the same way, but the origin of them is different. Um, in fact, intergroup emotions emerge in the social identification and differentiation process. Identification with the in-group and differentiation uh, with the out-group. Social psychology does not talk, does not refer this theory to populism. But as you can see, there is a very uh, uh, evident uh, merge between the two. Group identity becomes part of one's uh, individual identity. So. Uh, at some point, the individual feels to be the group, and when the group is attacked, the individual is also attacked. This explains also the emotional reactions individuals have uh, in the public uh, confrontations, for instance, or in the social networks, even when they are, uh, let's say, playing alone at home uh, or wherever they are. 
Um, therefore, in-group emotions are self-emotions. Uh, it doesn't matter if they are um, re related to them personally or to the group as a whole. Uh, um, even a, a bare group member can, uh, can embody the emotion of the group as if he or she would be the leader of the group. Therefore, there is a depersonalization of the individual identity. Uh, and uh, this means that the individual acts because he or she is part of the group and not because he or she necessarily would think to act in that way regardless of this identification process and vice versa as well. Um, so these uh, intergroup emotions define how the individuals feel within the group, so in the in-group and also how they relate with the out groups. And we are going to show, I'm going to show you what um, I think are the main emotions that are mobilized by them. So we have certainly negative emotions and the literature on populism has uh, increasingly studied and targeted these emotions. Maybe these are uh, especially fear and anger and resentment uh, are the most studied in the recent years, um, I think anxiety is very important and you will see later why. So I would summarize, of course, in these four areas of, uh, of the, what we call, emotion, uh, how populism mobilize, mobilizes uh, people. But then, we should also consider that these four emotions, and I think Amit has explained precisely how they do that. Then we have positive emotions as well. And here I want to complexify a little, uh, trying to make uh, a connection between the two. So we have security, pride, hope, and interest. Again, interest is something that the literature misses to focus on. I think it's something that we are bringing into the debate. and. Uh, um, um, based on the affective intelligence theory, I will show you later. And you, will see, you, you can see how the search for security is something that attaches people to populism or to populist phenomena, which in their narrative that you have just listened to in Amit's presentation, you see the need for lower and order is justified and even embodied by the people lynching is the most plastic representation of that. Of course, there you have Islamophobia as the main, uh, you know, phobia that uh, that is narrated within uh, in the nationalism at the moment. But you have a number of outgroups, and for each one of them, there will be a certain uh, fear that is then um, translated into security. Because when you identify uh, someone that is dangerous for you and someone else is telling you that is going to protect, then of course by following the, the guy that is going to protect you, then of course you feel secure. But then um, um, right-wing populism especially puts much emphasis on pride, you know? Pride to be, uh, pride means of course attachment to the values we have been talking about and also the tradition, to religion, but that also I, uh, means recognition, means belonging in the in-group, of course, no matter how ex exclusionary the in-group is. And uh, it produces identification, especially with the leader and, uh, and the party. Then it produces hope for change. Uh, it's a change related to status a uh, quo uh, which is narrated in the way we have seen and of course the hope is for the restoration of an order that is missed this is in the case of India I'm curious I know there are many Brazilians I'm, I'm not sure how much this applies to India uh, to Brazil at same uh, uh, in the same way uh, in for instance in Bolsonaro's uh, narrative uh, but of course this a restoration is it's exclusionary because it's related to the in-group, so it's only to the uh, ethically bound sense uh, community. 
uh, where there is a sense of justice that is limited within. And it creates trust, this hope creates trust for the leader. And finally, interest. Interest, uh, I think it's very important because it, uh, of course, is based on, on the fact that as much as a story is being told, the more uh, people are looking for information about that story. So this brings also, you know, what are called echo chambers, those places where people can find information they are looking for, they are raised interest for, and uh, uh, that then leads to, uh, you know, uh, truth and untruth, uh, fake news or misinformation, disinformation, and different or parallel, parallel channels of information. And of course, this is very much related to the internet and the use in relation to politics. So we see that there is, if we want, uh, I wouldn't say that it's so strict, need the, so direct. I really don't like to use uh, emotion labels like the ones you you see in the uh, screen. But we have to interact with each other. How can I explain you an emotion by describing it? Uh, therefore, at the moment, I have no better way to do that using the names that we generally use for them, but I'm not pretending that each one understands and feels fear the same way. So, let's assume this is a generalization, and also it's a generalization that from fear, you have security, from anger, identification, from anxiety, interest, and from resentment, hope. What is important is that you have a set of negative emotions that generally produce positive emotion. I'm not sure that this is also only as exclusive of the right. I think this is a political phenomenon which applies to all um, uh, formations. So what we see, um, and I'm trying to outline, I'm starting to outline the emotion narrative here. You see that narrative. Uh, 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 I, I mean, emotions are related to narrative and are collective because discrete, discrete emotions alone does not do not explain how uh, this party can gain uh, support and, and, and impact on political behavior. Not individual, nor individual emotion would do that. We see that this is a social process, and that's why social psychology seems to be fruitful. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, so we the individual sees, see the group as themselves, so this, this is precisely social, a social identification process which, is, which turns the collective into the personal. Um, and creates the logic uh, uh, of difference and equivalence as um, as uh, specified before. Um, this is also declined in specific context towards uh, specific outgroups, and these outgroups can change along, along the time. For instance, uh, <clears throat> when you don't have much immigration, migrants might not be the main target of uh, extreme right um, uh, narrative, but other internal minorities group uh, can, can be. This is, these are what uh, we could call functional needs. They are not foundational needs, they are functional needs. They are declined in a, in a specific context. And then, um, I mentioned earlier the affective intelligence theory. I want to sketch here why it is important. It is based on the neurosciences. Uh, you see a book there which is one of, um, of the books that work on this, but you have many uh, articles as well. And it's, this theory is based on two affective pre-conscious systems that lead to decision making. So, uh, George Marcus and colleagues believe that uh, the human takes decision based on these two systems, the disposition system and, and the surveillance system. The disposition system is at play constantly in our daily life and it gives us feedbacks of reward or punishment to guide us towards taking decisions based on routines and habits. So how is it reward and punishment pro provided to us is through enthusiasm or reward, aversion 
for punishment. When something goes wrong or there are new information or there, there is something uh, unexpected in our routine, then the surveillance system is activated through anxiety. So you see why anxiety is so important. Regardless of the fact that, again, I don't want to stick on um, labels of emotions, but the anxiety here uh, may, it's an alarm to the disposition system that activates the surveillance system where then fear and interest or one of them uh, lead to find out a solution for the unexpected situation that we are living, uh, regardless of whether individual or as a group. And so, uh, action are taken to overcome this situation in order to create a new routine and come back to the disposition system. I find this interesting because that points out to the center, uh, as you can see, to the to the um, inter to interest as an uh, emotion that is uh, very much uh, below the, the radar of populist scholars. So, emotion narrative, I give you my definition, um, I've been presenting this already, so it's a distinct account of a range of emotions, both positive and negative, that entangle social and political groups, providing identification, idealization, and differentiation. They are based on the understanding that social and political aggregation is produced through rational and emotional signification that defines the relationship between the in-group, us, and the out-groups, them. The emotion narrative highlights the existence of the interconnectedness of various, various emotions in specific process of social, political, idealization, identification, and differentiation, assuming that it is produced by a framing story that is dynamic in itself. So these narratives are not static, they are a process, they are processes. And political mythology, I take this from the literature, and uh, uh, mainly they are discursive constructions that create and enforce social and political identities, operationalized to generate and strengthen acceptability for political aggregation and representation. As opposed to theoretical constructions, they entail a strong relation with contingency mobilize emotion and facilitate popular understanding and identification. They are dynamic, again they are processes. Um, the constituted myths can be reframed, but the foundational myths generally are more slow to change than myths that are uh, contextual. And they are attenuated or recreative and the narrative that connects them change for political purposes. Political mythologies are prone to be re-engineered or reorganized according to the different needs in specific socio-political contexts and in different times. <clears throat> I think I am almost over my time. I, I hope I have I, I have time just to leave this slide on the screen in order to support uh, the debate after the discussion uh, by Professor Boventura. So why it happened? I think that uh, uh, there is an underestimation of the value of mythology, narrative, and emotions in politics. How it happened? There is um, excessive re the excess of representation in democracy. Um, uh, there is a, a verb missing there. Undermines the internal energy by uh, abating civil society imagination and commitment. There is a kind of commodification of politics. This is uh, quite mainstream, as we have been discussing several times. But uh, there is also a political inability to, man to undermine the roots of social inequalities and oppression. So if, you think, if I think of Brazil now, I think that may be one of the uh, causes of um, of uh, uh, extreme right uh, populism. And where it happens, well, we see that it's uh, in all the continents, um, least where political prophecy, which includes imagination and the possibility to act, 
is under control of law and order. But even there, we see that um, movements are emerging. I'm thinking of Iran and China at the moment. Um, and we will see whether they will be able to organize as a social, socio-political identity, create um, an empty signifier, and, and put forward a populist mobilization. So what is needed? What are, what are the lessons for democracy? I think imagination. I think that you don't see the, yeah. Imagination, narrative, and emotions are fundamental for social identity and change. So I think I can leave it at it. And, uh, Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with you here. We are resuming our presential activities. And I missed a lot during the pandemic that we couldn't meet the faces. We couldn't go out for dinner and drink and have our celebrations of collective life, which I think is very important for this center. I'm very, very proud of my two younger colleagues that just presented their papers, and they are working papers on their PhD project. So in the case of Cristiano, it's an advanced project that he's engaged in. We are funded by the European Union, and um, I, uh, I'm very glad that we are here to be able to discuss. It is usual in this center, I think we discuss very vividly, very frankly, uh, our differences, our similarities, and that's the way we have to proceed and to progress in our work. Well, I approach these two studies from the perspective of the critical theory I've been putting forward. And I've been trying, particularly in the last 15 years, to produce, propose a non-Eurocentric a critical theory, which I've been calling the Epistemologies of the South. It is from that perspective that I analyze the, the two, uh, the two uh, papers that we have before us. Uh, and of course, the, the, this idea of a non-Eurocentric uh, critical theory uh, should not uh, lead us astray and think that there is nothing to do with the Eurocentric critical theory. I think that uh, we are here to build uh, new ideas on the base of old ideas. I, I've never, in the Epistemology of the South, we don't create upon the ruins of anything. We create with the ruins, and we progress with them. So, for instance, Marxism is very important for me. I would say that uh, uh, Marxism today is a Eurocentric, in general, Eurocentric uh, critical theory. But that has been very influential in my own uh, uh, development, and I stick to it, uh, because I include it in a broader framework in which Marxism, of course, is a part. Well, I think, for looking at these papers from the perspective, a critical perspective, two things emerge. First, why are we studying these things today? Why this uh, populism, nationalism, uh, and in general, extreme right, even though in Christian Genoli you can see that there is a kind of an equivalence between left populism and right populism. I'm going to address that later on. But in general, all these issues have become very important in recent years. And basically because of the growth of extreme right. Uh, it's a global growth. And I think that we should address the reasons why in different parts of the world, in India, in Brazil, in Europe, in many countries in Africa, in the United States, we see the growth of uh, extreme right uh, uh, politics that leads into these uh, problems. Well, I have been uh, uh, trying to, to show that this is the second phase of the neoliberal uh, version of capitalism that started to become a global version of capitalism uh, by the 1980s of the previous uh, century. And in fact, the neoliberalism based on the idea of the shrinking of the state, of uh, against uh, fiscal policies and, uh, and um, taxes for the rich, the liberalization, privatization, shrinking the state, the state is corrupt, the state is uh, inefficient, the markets are the great rationalists 
rationalizer of social life, and everything should, as far as as much as possible, to be privatized. Well, the first phase of neoliberalism is a global version of capitalism. Uh, we should address another question, which I'm not going to address here: is why neoliberalism came in now. But <laughs> we have tried before. In fact, it started in Latin America in 1973 with uh, Pinochet in Chile and then developed all over the world in a sense. Uh, before that was a theory, a minority theory in economics, right? Well, I think the first phase was characterized by the critique of social and political rights, social and economic rights that have been embedded in uh, social democracy and liberal democracy in general, the social policies, uh, public health, uh, public education, a public system of pensions and uh, 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 social security. All these public services were considered to be damaging uh, the performance of the economy. So we should privatize them. Everything that is uh, susceptible of being profitable should be privatized. So education is profitable. Health is profitable. Should be privatized. So that was the critique of social um, democracy that increased <coughs> immensely after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1991. The process 1989, 1991. And I think that we are uh, addressing uh, a second phase. This phase is almost complete. In fact, social democracy is in crisis everywhere. And social rights, in fact, and economic rights have been eroded in many countries. In fact, we are, very often we say that for the people that are resisting against domination, which is my perspective, in fact, we are in a period of defensive struggles. Uh, if you notice about the social movements with which I interact, they are not fighting for new rights. They are, they are fighting to defend the rights they already had and are losing. So it's very defensive, both in labor power, in labor rights, in education rights, social rights, economic rights, and so on. So we are in a period of defensive struggles, uh, and uh, that's why I think uh, uh, that is the first phase of neoliberalism. Then there is a second phase, and the second phase is what we are entering now. What we have been there for almost uh, six or five, five years is that the neoliberalism is not enough now to criticize social and economic rights. It's addressing the core of, of liberal democracy, civic and political rights, free expression, freedom of parties, the liberal system of politics. All of it is under attack by the, uh, the extreme right. Why are they doing that? Why they are moving from the critique against social rights to the critique of individual political civic rights? Well, if we read closely uh, the, the documents that come from the CIA, from the International Monetary Fund, these are documents that all of us in the critical theory should be reading very closely. Uh, they say that particularly after the pandemic, we are going to witness social unrest everywhere in the world. Because uh, there was an emergency, there was a crisis, the social crisis is the pandemic after the crisis, the, the financial crisis of 2008, and therefore it is predicted that we are going to uh, have uh, strong periods of very acute social resistance, which has to be fought against. And the states have no other weapons to fight against those under the neoliberal creed other than repressive uh, reactions. And the repression has to be very drastic and probably is not compatible with democracy. So we are going to have more uh, emergency states, states of siege, situations of exceptional uh, behavior that leads to more autocratic systems. And therefore, the idea that democracy cannot be relied on to resist against the social unrest that is coming. That's, I think that's the large picture, picture that probably we are not aware of, but the people that are in charge of the system are of course thinking about that. How they are going to, to control the masses if they just start resisting everywhere against the, these uh, unprecedented uh, concentration of wealth in which the eight uh, richest people in the world have as much wealth as the uh, half of the world population, the poor half of the world population, 3.5 uh, million people. 
So this is real outrageous. It's a monstrosity. Should it be accepted with a, as a banality? Well, I think they really think that probably we, we need more muscle on the part of the repressive state to fight against this, in my view. This is at least one of the reasons why we have the growth of extreme right. And of course, it's of much concern to the people that are really struggling for democracy, particularly in countries like Portugal or Brazil, uh, in which democracy is still a minority period in their histories, because most of their histories have been under dictatorship, not democracy. So democracy are not really stabilized in our world today. And if they think they are, well, that's a, uh, that is a danger. So I think what I see here is that this extreme right is using lots of uh, systems and uh, uh, tactics, and some of them are very clear in these uh, in these papers that they are presenting. The first one is uh, Amit and uh, concerning Amit's paper and uh, uh, Cristiano, we can see uh, already two styles of differences. Uh, uh, Cristiano in his presentation is very much. Uh, concerned about uh, uh, analytical um, uh, precision about the different <coughs> concepts and different distinctions. Amit is much more concerned about the social dynamics of things. I think, in fact, we need some analytical precision because we talk about nationalism, we talk about populism, we talk about populist nationalism, we talk about nationalistic populism. What is this? Well, in my view, Populism is a system in which the main actors are the people defined in all vagueness and the leader. That is to say, populism for me is a political system in which the mediation of the political system, that is to say, the parties, the institutions, etc., don't count anymore. What counts above all is the leader and the people. This is for me is the way I conceive of populism. Nationalism is a different thing. Nationalism has two roots and they are very different with the same name. One is the civic nation. The civic nation is the nation of the people that are bound within the same geopolitical boundaries. That is to say all of us are Portuguese, all of us are Brazilians, all of us are Indians, all of us are Italians because we live, we are citizens, or we live in this geopolitical space. We call it the civic nation. The other is the concept of ethnocultural nation. That's the concept that the indigenous people use to define, for instance, their identity. They are their nations, the Cherokee nation, the Aymara, the Quechua nation. They don't call themselves in Latin America, but they could. The nation as a kind of a common belongingness, a kind of the same ethnocultural world. Well, these two nationalisms are, the, are very different, of course. And in fact, when civic nationalism emerges, particularly in Europe, from the 17th century onwards, it is trying to debunk, to eliminate ethnocultural nationalism. The problem is that civic nation very often is based on the ethnocultural nation. Uh, not always, but sometimes. What Modi is doing is to implant into a civic nation the superimposed the concept of ethnocultural. <coughs> that is to say, there is the Indian nation, the Kandian nation, so to say, and now the Modi nation is the Hindu nation. So upon a civic concept, we implant an ethnocultural concept of nation. And these uh, two concepts have been fighting each other for a long time. And there is a dynamics that we should uh, understand. Uh, so it is important to see what we are talking about. And in this uh, perspective, we should also be precise how we uh, analyze this phenomenon. From a critical perspective, that is to say, a perspective that is not satisfied with the current state of affairs and thinks that our societies are unjust and equal and fair and should be and could be better. It's not a fatality, all this concentration of wealth. 
all this misery side by side with those temptations and uh, which are almost scandalous. The idea that we could have a better society, actually. The idea of liberation, the idea of emancipation, and so on. It is very important for us to distinguish between objectivity and neutrality. We are objective in our analysis. That's why we are here. We are studying methodologies. We are studying concepts. We are trying to be precise. But we are not neutral. Which side are we on? We are, si we are on the side of the extreme right forces, or the anti-democratic forces, or are on the side of democratic forces? Well, I have no doubt. We are, I am at least, uh, and I think most of you are, and I would, uh, I would desire all of you are, on the side of the democratic theory, of the uh, counter anti uh, or anti extreme right forces. Well, if this is so, then how do we really analyze this phenomenon? With Amit's uh, paper, I have almost no difficulty because I think I see there a very good analysis of Indutva uh, and how this extreme right perspective uh, moves from Gujarat in, in the beginning of the, the millennium and then becomes uh, you know, a, a kind of a national ideology, an hegemonic ideology, and it's, uh, it's part of the current toward the extreme right. We have to remember that Modi, for a while, was forbidden to enter the United States as a terrorist because of the, of the Gujarat's massacres of the Muslims and because of the, the gross violation of human rights. But then, as usual in the United States, he becomes useful to use Modi in the strategy against India, against China, and so on. And all of a sudden, Modi is uh, welcomed in the United States, and everything is forgotten about him. And now, uh, Biden is uh, you know, pleading uh, to India to be more aggressive against Russia and against China, and so on. So it's the usual geopolitics of the United States. But you know, you can see that in this case, Amit is analyzing the, the rise of Modi, and analyzing the resistance against it. So the critical approach demands that we also put in the picture the resistance. Because in fact, the resistance always exists. From the epistemologies of the cell perspective, which, as you know, is this clear to analyze knowledge is born in struggle against domination, be it capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. I think that it's very important to say that all these phenomena, no matter how powerful they are, they need resistance. How this resistance takes place. So I think that Amit is doing that and is doing that fine. Because I think if I, I've been reading a lot, uh, you know, to, because I like to honor always my younger colleagues and both Amit and Christiana have been forcing me in most recent days to study a lot about their topics. And um, it is interesting, I mean, that, that uh, India Forum just, forum just recently published a very interesting paper, which I'd like, I would advise you to read, uh, is also, if you haven't read it already, is, uh, is about the paradoxic uh, character of Indian democracy. But because we see India is, is a continent, is a subcontinent, it's, it's vast, like Brazil. So, we see lots of interesting initiatives, democratic initiatives emerging in, in India, in the different states, in different localities, participatory, uh, liberal, even, um, you know, electoral uh, initiatives in democracy. And at the same time, at the central level, we see this rise in the polarization conducted by, by Narendra Modi. It is a kind of a paradox that there is a life of very living type of democratic experiences in many states of India, to rely on that paper, of course, and, uh, and the constraints from the center. Then it's very important to see the role of the institutions, the courts, for instance. But we can see, as uh, Amit is trying to convey to us, and does that very well, is the role of the people. I mean, the farmers' protest, as you have seen here, they, were, they took place during the pandemic. It's not before or after. It was during the pandemic. For a year. This is absolutely impossible to understand for a Westerner. For something, for someone from the North Hemisphere. How could these farmers stay there for so long? 
in the midst of the pandemic. Moreover, they succeeded. The laws were overturned because of their resistance. I mean, this is remarkable. The rule of women. That many people like to see that feminism was born in the north and so on. But you can see all these uh, feminist uh, protagonism in India today. As you can see that the Mozambican parliament has many more women than the Portuguese parliament, which is a very fine minority. What in Mozambique is almost <coughs> parity now. So you can see all these uh, important factors that call for us to, to pay attention to the resistances. And also to see the similarities, because to conduct social sciences is to do comparisons. But so when I, Amit was uh, discussing, I was thinking all the time about a situation in which we had, uh, here in Europe, very close home, we have a, a region of, the, of, of Europe in which the conviviality among different religions was very well, was very peaceful, where the intermarriage between Muslims and Christians, Orthodox and Catholic was prevalent in the Balkans. That was a marvelous <coughs> intermarriage system there. All of a sudden, because of uh, local errors and because of external forces, uh, the old Yugoslavia basically is destroyed. And all of a sudden we have all these fights, we have the massacres, we have Srebrenica, we have all the massacres against Muslims, against Christians, the polarization. So religion is a good thing. The political religion, the political use of religion is awful. And this polarization is just uh, what is the perversion. For us here at says it's very important to understand polarization because it's the other side of diversity. We have been struggling for diversity. Different dominations, we don't say capitalism. We say capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. So that the, visible, the, the, the struggles against capitalism are as visible as the struggles against racism, against uh, sexism. Diversity. <coughs> but diversity has this perverse effect. If, if the political leaders use it in, in the wrong ways, they transform it in polarization, as in them. And all of a sudden, Muslims and, uh, and Christians that lived in the Balkans all of a sudden are polarized and you have all this infighting and the situation is not controlled. I was recently in Macedonia and could see how these people have been in conviviality for such a long time. And all of a sudden, the enemies are there, the us and them, as, uh, as, uh, as uh, Cristiano was telling us. So I think that... Uh, we have to understand the political mobilization of difference can lead to identitarian chaos, as today often it leads to, into extreme right politics. So I think this is one of the lessons that we should bear in mind. Well, coming to a Cristiano's paper, I have more difficulty in analyzing Cristiano's paper from a critical perspective. Because I think it is not his fault. I know Christian for a long time. It is the fault of the approach that he's using. I have nothing against social psychology. I myself, I'm now writing about the mental health in our current issue and current times. And I think that I have to interact. Last week I was in Rio de Janeiro uh, discussing with psychoanalysts the questions of mental health and, uh, and sociology. Now, I really praise all the social psychologists, psychiatrists, and uh, psychoanalysts. The social psychologists uh, uh, are very uh, inherent difficulty in building critical approaches to it. So we try to see behaviors and patterns of behavior in a kind of a neutral, objective and neutral way. And uh, I see here uh, that uh, uh, Christian, for instance, equates left populism and right populism. I didn't do that. Or if I you do that, I you specify. What is left populism? Because if you look at the newspapers today, you see very often that if a party promotes social policies, public health, public education, is considered populist by the extreme right, by the right. The Workers' Party now in, uh, in Brazil, uh, the Lula's part, is fighting the uh, insult, in fact, that they are populist because they want to bring back social policies. 
because everything that is social policies is considered populist. This is not populism. This is not populism. And much less left populism. Left populism is when the leader, one leader, assumes the, the paper, the role and the protagonism of the only provider of those goods. Or as I would say that uh, uh, Cuba, during a certain period, in particular under, under Fidel, was a period of left populism. We could say that. We could also say that Venezuela, during the people of period of Chavez, particularly the first Chavez, uh, in fact, could be considered populist because all of a sudden the institutions, the mediations in a Venezuelan society disappeared and was just the leader of the people. Well, I don't see that uh, in Brazil it is the case uh, because I think there are parties and the parties are there and the institutions and Supreme Court and other courts and so on. Institutions are there on the border of chaos, in fact, because the coup is very close to be, uh, is not eliminated at all at this point. I just came back from there and I can tell you that, that I'm very worried about the near future of Brazil uh, before the inauguration of Lula, of Lula and probably after. Because there are people that are really engaged in making even the inauguration on 1st of January impossible. Uh, and they are working underground on that. And you have, we have now, it is not so underground because the news are coming out, we can discuss that later on in the debate. So what I think is that, Analyzing emotions, it's very important. But why it is important? It's only at the end that Christian, almost as a, an afterthought, says, what is the contribution of this for democratic theory? During his presentation, I didn't see anything that could say that, in fact, he's trying to strengthen democratic theory. Because the only way of a critical theory can analyze a phenomenon is not to see the fate of democracy, is to strengthen democracy, to see the risks. The risks are the emotions. They are not emotions. They are not the risks. For those that have been reading my work, they can say our emotions are important. For instance, in the end of Cognitive Empire, I dedicate a full chapter on uh, the warm reason, as I call the warm reason, a raison quente. What is uh, yeah, a warm reason? is precisely the idea that I have never seen anyone fighting for social justice out of exclusive rational uh, reasons. They used to say, I decided to be against uh, uh, this oppression, against dictatorship, against the inequality, because rationally I think it's very important. No, we never do that. We fight against injustice if there is a gut reaction, an emotion, an indignation, sometimes anger. I was. Uh, yesterday in our Porto discussing uh, very dear people that work with me for a long time, the rappers in Brazil and other countries. And now uh, Manu Brown, the Brazilians here know what I'm talking about, from Russianized MCs, how uh, Manu Brown said, but audio, a raiva, is positive for us. I mean, the people that were living in the periphery in the 2000s, the rage they had it was very important because they, there was mobilizing for the struggle. So I, I cannot say that emotions are wrong. What I have to analyze is what for are you using the emotions? Well, in order to analyze for why I'm interested in this, and all I'm, uh, you know, Christian has been helping me a lot, because I would say that uh, sometimes when you read theories for a long time, as I have been doing, uh, sometimes we fall into traps and we don't know our traps. For instance, the liberal theory always uh, tried us to believe, uh, particularly economic theory, but also political theory, uh, you know, rational choice, begin with, that, that we decide upon rational reasons. That is, uh, we calculate. Homo economics, what is homo economics? It's, it's, a, it's a guy that is rational enough to see what are the demands, what are the, the supply, what are the prices, and he chooses among the best possibilities, always. Well, this is one side of theory, because if you look back and you go through the theories, you can see the, or the fathers 
there were no mothers in this theory actually, the fathers of this theory, all of them have been dealing with emotions, with passions. For instance, if you read Leviathan by Hobbes, I mean, Hobbes is about passions, it's about fear. The fear of the people that lead to the leader. It's not about rationality. If you go back and read Thucydides, Thucydides, the history of the Peloponnesus, what, what does Thucydides say? He says that people are run by greed, by honor, and by fear. So these are emotions. Well, emotions are very useful. But I want to analyze what kinds of emotions are being promoted by the extreme right. What are emotions that are really being? Why? Because we say that today are these global networks, red sociais. The social networks are being used much more effectively by the extreme right, far right, as you want to call it, with precise psychological analysis of these emotions, of these types of emotions. I've been reading about that. For the, the distinction between discrete emotions and conglomeration of emotions. What is the difference between anger and enthusiasm? Because anger and enthusiasm, both of them, both of them, create the disposition, not surveillance, so the two concepts. Disposition is a propensity to act, to participate while anxiety and fear probably create the propensity to surveillance, to fatality, to not participate, to avoid, to withdraw, so to say, abstention sometimes in politics, right? So why what they are doing, and now I could have the key, why they are emphasizing so much anger at this point. And I go back to the social psychology texts, and what tell me? Anger is the discrete emotion that correlates more positively with participation in politics. Anger, raiva, cholera, ira. That would be the translation into Portuguese, right? It's not enthusiasm, it's rage. Anger. And what, what these studies are telling us is a second thing, is that it mobilizes for participation, but makes people indifferent to the nature, the quality of the information. That is to say, the reliability of information. That is to say, they are trust, they tend to trust fake news, basically. That's what they say, right? Even though they don't use these words. It's, it's not inside social psychology. They have this idea that they don't really participate, the concept that they use most common is they are eager to participate but not thoughtful participation. This is to say rational participation based on reliable information. Well, what I see these days is precisely this. How people, I was discussing with people, you can't imagine in Brazil recently, that believe in fact that the, the earth is a, a, a straight about the plane, not round. Flat. Eh? Flat. Flat. Right, flat. Flat. Yeah, I'm sorry. I hate so much the concept that I will forget about it. <laughs> well, it's, it is very, very curious to see the reasons why they say that. Because they use the, our, our arguments against us. Have you ever seen? Have you ever seen the, 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 except from afar, who tells you that image is, you know, the blue coming from the satellites, I would imagine. Well, it is true that we never went to the end of the world and then there is an abyss. That's our argument. If it is flat, just go there and then you fall into the abyss. But you have never demonstrated me the, the opposite. So this idea is very powerful among people because it's just a caricature. Because many of your fake news are not that radical, are much less radical. So I think that we have a, a perspective, a problem here, is that what for this project? What is the use of this project? How they organize this project in such a way 
that I minimize the ways in which it can be used by extreme right forces to say, well, look at that project, interesting project. They, he's telling us how we should proceed. This is not really trivial. You know probably the history of these two marvelous, wonderful Chilean researchers. I always mention this case because many people don't know it, except my friends here at West. These uh, eye uh, researchers, eye researchers in, uh, in ophthalmology in Chile that analyzed for years the eye of the um, mosca, the fly. fly, the eye of the fly. And all of a sudden, all their studies were used to develop the smart bombs. Because the smart bombs have an eye like the fly. So they use the targets, so that's why the bomb and the missiles can go one way or the other. They don't go straight. One of the guys went crazy, really mad, because he couldn't believe that such a good research could be used for such awful purposes. We also know the case of the atomic physics and what happened to the physicists that developed the atomic bomb. Many of them, in fact, had to be cared about for the rest of their lives because they couldn't live with the consequences. So I think that we in psychology, in these kinds of studies, it's very important to analyze the emotions because it is not only by rationality that people behave in our world. This is absolutely clear. For a long time, both in the critical theory and in the conventional theory, we believed that people were rational, but there were different reasons. And that's why we differ. Different theories and different reasons. But now we see that our not reasons are emotions that can paralyze us, can mobilize us. Because after all, going back to our previous analysis, what were the revolutionaries? Were these people were really just uh, rational people, the revolutionaries? For instance, Go back and try to analyze this. It's fabulous our world today to analyze this. I, I advise you to read uh, the memoir of the great revolutionary because it didn't fit rather in the communists or the anarchists and so on. It's almost unknown for many people. His name is Victor Serge. If you analyze the memoirs of this young fellow, of Belgian origin, his parents were communists from Russia, and Victor Serge who died in in, uh, in exile in Mexico in 1945 or something. He, lived, he was in Russia during all this period of the Soviet Union, the beginning of the revolution. Read the memoirs and look what are the emotions of the revolutionaries. In the midst of the worst possible conditions there, you have a non-romantic view of the revolution. Not the romantic view that we get revolutionaries. You see the anxieties. You can see how my colleagues how my colleagues could develop, but how the realities were different. They were different emotions because they believed that they were creating a, a, a new man. A new world was a new man, they would say, not a new person as you say today. Omenov. Omenov would be the revolutionary person that does not look individually, looks collectively. And that why he's ready for sacrifices because in the name of something that will be a better future for everyone. Who is ready to do this today? We are not, in most cases. Are we too individualistic? Well, it's another emotion, it's another way of looking at the world. But if you are more individualistic, in fact, what is entrepreneurship? Which is, uh, you know, preaching, being preached everywhere in our schools and our universities. It has to be your own slave or your own master. Basically the same thing, quite frankly. Because if you succeed, you may be a master, but if you don't succeed, you'll be a slave. Uh, they never say that most people fail, that, therefore most people are slaves. Auto-slaves or self-slaves, not self-masters. So different contexts promote different emotions. What are the emotions that are being promoted these days? Why fear, hunger, anxiety, and enthusiasm? Enthusiasm is put there. 
but usually in these studies, the enthusiasm comes at the end, is when the hunger develops participation and they go for the struggle, killing the other with enthusiasm. Hate speech. Create the enthusiasm to liquidate the other, to kill the other. Some people have seen uh, a member of the parliament, Zambelli in Brazil recently, pointing a gun to a guy and chasing the guy in the street to kill him. Was this, I mean, you know, some theater thing or a lecture book? Nobody knows. But the guy could have been killed, right? Another guy tried to kill Christina Kirchner in, uh, in Argentina very recently. Didn't succeed. Was it a trick? Well, people say that really the guy wanted to kill her, but didn't manage to do so. What kind of enthusiasm takes someone? What kind of emotion that I can destroy the other? Because it's the them in such an extreme way. It doesn't belong to me. It's an animal. It's a savage. It's an usurper. It's a terrorist. It's a communist. It's whatever. It's subhuman. So for those that uh, uh, deal with my smells of the South, uh, can see what I'm trying to get at. Extreme right is the promotion of the Visa line. The Visa line is growing, dividing humans from subhumans. And while we thought that initially that was colonialism linked to the color of the skin and the patriarchy uh, uh, leading to referring to gender would be the ontological degradations that create subhumanities. As I used to say, racialized bodies and sexualized bodies. That's where the, the Arisa line I think that today, and that's an hypothesis, I have to work more on this, <clears throat> but I'm offering it uh, for them to develop if they want, is, is whether now the extreme right is developing in such a way that more people, from one reason or the other, maybe the Cards, maybe the Muslims, maybe uh, leftist orientation, they are considered subhumans. It is true that in the caste system, of course, if you are Adivasi or Dalits, you are really close to be a subhuman treated like, in spite of the constitution. Right? So I think that Abyssal line is advanced. That's why I agree theoretically these studies. Abyssal line is advanced, and for those that know how I divide societies between those that are ruled by a metropolitan, can I draw it a bit on more? Uh, we could see graphically, and this is my concluding remark to my dear friends and colleagues. How come this is subversion of says? How is it possible that in this seminar a guy put a book here on Jack Kerouac? Can you see the anger of Jack Kerouac? It's like Russian Knight, Mano Brown. Read Jack Kerouac, The Beat Generation of the United States. This guy is fabulous, great poet. And Jack exactly go on the road in the 70s, the hip generation or beat generation. <coughs> See how much anger there is, but against capitalism, against racism. These guys, on the road. That's the anger opposite the anger of the extreme right. That's, I, it was not by just you and you, <laughs> you put it there. <laughs> I know you. Okay. Well, dear friends, this is a the Abyssa line. I usually draw it. I don't know why I put on the vertical or horizontal. It could be both ways. In your work, you can use it. And I say that here is the metropolitan. This is the Abyssa line. This is the metropolitan sociability, and this is the colonial sociability. And uh, during colonialism, historical colonialism, in today's societies are divided by this. And therefore, this society is run, is protected by law, by democracy, by the rule of law, is run by the concepts of uh, regulation and emancipation. This colonial sociability is not run by ideas of regulation or emancipation. It is run by the ideas of violence and appropriation. It's completely different. And if you look at that, and I always say the examples, they mention the examples that are close to me, uh, as that uh, famous man, some of you, probably not all of you, 
I've repeated to my younger student from the West in Rio de Janeiro, black guy, at the university. Of course, he's, he feels very well at the West because he's black, but he's, everybody likes him, he's wonderful. During the university is here. But when he leaves the university, crosses the Maracanã, and goes to his favela, he's stopped by the police every 20 minutes to open the backpack. Open his backpack and show the computer. And the police, yes, go on. 20 minutes later, the police, another policeman, man, asks him to open the backpack, and he opens again. And then the third time, when he's up to enter in the favela, and after the third time, the young guy asked the policeman, why are you doing this? Since I left the words already three times, the police asked me to open the backpack. And the police tells him, there is nothing personal against you. Our protocol tells us, professional protocol, that in light of certain types of people, like color, we have to do this. Institutional racism, that's what it is. What is my reading? This young guy lives here at Wesh, but when he goes to the favela, he's crossing the Ibiza line, he's being treated as subhuman by the police, in the same society. So the Ibiza line is an experience, everyday experience, like the woman that works in a restaurant, protected, even though discriminated probably, protected by law, but when arrives at home, she may be assassinated by the partner. At that moment, or if she's in India, probably in the public transportation, very likely be a, a victim of sexual assault. And probably in Lisbon or here, I don't know. In Zidane Paris, the possibility of being killed is very high. So she crosses the side. You see? So this idea for the extreme right is my reading is this. The extreme right seems the growth. The moving of the, the Abyss line in this direction. More people are fully unprotected, considered subhuman. Less people are being fully protected in our societies. This is the characteristic of a society in a period of defensive struggles, of reactionary and conservative thinking as a mainstream and not a progressive thinking is the advance of the Ibiza line. In this direction, less people protected, more people unprotected. And that's why many people, maybe <laughs> one of the costs, workers. A worker with rights is here, not here. We always study that workers work with rights, labor rights. But if you eliminate the worker rights and everybody's Uber worker, or they are workers in the Bangladesh, women, then when they are 35 years of age, many of them are blind because of the intensity of sewing and the sewing machines in the textile, in the garment industry, well, probably they are here, not there. You see? They have no rights. So uh, that's why I see the promising of these studies. That will be my comment. Thank you very much.